In 2025, Holliston will celebrate its 300th anniversary. Leading up to that milestone, HCAT will feature the history, events, and the people that make Holliston a great town. Today, our guest is longtime citizen John Loesch. Welcome, John. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. So, uh, we'll start with the obvious question. How long have you lived in Holliston? 60 years. Okay. Since April. April. Okay. And where where did you grow up? Because you weren't you were not a, you're not a townie, or maybe you are a townie. I don't know. I'm more townie than you'd think. But uh, I grew up in Newton, mm -hmm. but I have the same Midwestern accent as both my parents. So. Yes. And so, where does the name Loesch come from? It's a German name. Uh, my son visited the hometown a year ago. He was. Uh, he works for the Library of Congress, and he was over there looking for some literature. And he found records in the church of our family that came here in 1830. So we've been around a while. I guess so. That's, we're, we're Americans now. Yes, that's a great story. Um, so why did, you, um, why did you move to Holliston? Bobby Blair's family, a uh, man named Jerry Driscoll, was my father's neighbor. They were close friends. And uh, my father used to come out here with Jerry sometimes to visit Jerry's sister, who before you were here probably still had the little dress shop where I think Mary Greendale had a shop at one time. Okay. And uh, so we knew that part of it. And then I knew a fellow that was a clockmaker out here. And I discovered that I could pay rent uh, less, uh, paying a mortgage than I was paying rent to have a shop in Wellesley. Mm -hmm. And my business was mostly repairing antiques, so I didn't uh, need to have a street shop. Therefore, I made the move out here when my lease ran out. So you moved your whole family out to Holliston, and you did you run your business out of your home? Yeah, I, the whole family was me when I came out here. Okay. And then, uh, and was that way for I think four years, something like that. I've lost track. Uh, anyhow, there was a building in back of the house. I, uh, I had surveyed the, I looked at a lot of properties. And this one seemed to be what I needed. It was a nice house. I had a big barn. Don't ever get a barn. The junk comes until it's filled up. And uh, then there was a building that I rehabbed to use as my machine shop. And most of my work was restoring clocks and scientific instruments. So it was essentially a metalworking shop. Okay. How did you learn how to do that? I started as a kid. Uh, I got acquainted with the jeweler. I think he hired me to wash his windows. And uh, then he'd send me into Boston for material. I'd come up from school. Mm -hmm. I was 12 years old, so I've been at it over 75 years now, if you count those beginning years. And uh, I liked it. I went to college, majored in uh, uh, history. Mm -hmm. And of course, I think half the papers I wrote were on history of clocks and scientific instruments. And uh, then I was working summers in the E. Howard Clock Factory in Waltham. And the uh, job opened up for me. And I told my father, I'll go nights and get the last semester. He's still waiting, I think. And, uh, <laughs> you went I, right to work. I went to work at Howard, and then I got sent to another company. Uh, I had friends watching for me. Mm -hmm. It was a period when there was nobody interested in what I was interested in. But anyhow, my friends uh, told me it was, go see old man Olson. He may be looking for somebody. And that was the briefest interview I ever had. I introduced myself, and he hired me. <laughs> So it was all set up. And so what was it that interested you about clocks and scientific instruments? The mechanics as much mm -hmm. as anything. Mm -hmm. uh, there's always been machinists and mechanics in my family, so it was nothing new. And uh, so I just kind of fell into place. Yeah, that's a, that's a skill and a mindset that was handed down to you, it seems. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you also got involved with a planetarium at one time. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yes, that's the one. That, well, there's several at Harvard, and I worked on all of them. 
But the one that's most noted is a thing that's about six and a half feet in diameter. It was made by a clockmaker, Joseph Pope. The Holliston Historical Society may still have a Joseph Pope grandfather clock that I restored many, many years ago. But Joseph Pope made the thing counting on somebody encouraging the state to buy it. Mm -hmm. And the I'm vague, I've forgotten now. I think what happened was that he had a friend that encouraged the legislature to put up a fund to buy it for Harvard. And I remember lecturing about it when I was in the legislature. They put up one lottery for one purpose, and then it was gone. Mm -hmm. When I was there, we introduced the lottery that goes forever. Oh, yes, of course. So what did the planet, what did this object do that you, you worked on? It's a model of the solar system. Mm -hmm. As it was known in 1763, and uh, you stand outside and turn a crank, and this monstrous amount of gears uh, move all the planets around, around the sun. Mm -hmm. And that was more important than people realized, because it was still considerable assurance that the Earth was the center of the universe and the, everything went around the Earth. Uh, There's still people that think that way, but they're in Congress now. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So do you still follow the stars? <laughs> do you know that I couldn't even identify them? You do not have to be an astronomer to work on a machine like that. Okay. Uh, my job was to sort gears, mm -hmm. had to replace some of them, and... Uh, uh, it had had a rough life when it came to me. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was able to take everything apart and deduce its logical extensions. But to this day, I don't think I could recite all the planets in the right order. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about Holliston. What was the town like when you moved here 60 years ago? That was the one question on there that I'm not sure of. My mind tells me that it was uh, 1,400 people. Mm -hmm. and I think it was more than that. I'm not sure. But it was right as the town started to expand. We're up to, what, 14 or 15,000 now. Exactly. But when I moved here, uh, it didn't take long to know everybody in town. Well, uh, You were either on the street and met them or mm -hmm. you, you were a hermit and never came out town, downtown. So I was on the Republican Town Committee in Wellesley. When I came out here, I joined the local town committee. And things have reversed significantly in these 60 years. Uh, you, you'd have trouble finding a Democrat in Holliston unless it was Mary Callahan. In the, in, <laughs> but now it's opposite. Uh, you know, it's, yeah. It's and, reversed. Uh, Yep. And uh, probably just as well, because uh, although I don't intend to get particularly political, uh, the Republican Party today isn't the one I belong to, and I withdrew my membership about 20 years ago. Oh, so you're an independent now? Yeah. Okay. You're, yeah, I didn't think I, for two reasons, I didn't join the Democratic Party. One, they're a party just like the Republicans. They just come closer to a lot of my thinking now. And the other thing was, there were still a lot of people that worked very hard to get me elected, and I didn't feel it was appropriate to offend them. A lady that was what's now my age, as a matter of fact, the last time I talked to her, and she was still a strong Republican. She didn't know anything about the party, but she'd always been a Republican. And why irritate somebody like that? Well, it seems that 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 can happen. People start being it's that's a, they become a Republican or a Democrat and they never change. Um, but in terms of Holliston itself, was it were there a lot of farms back then? What did most people do for work? Did they work in town or did they go outside of town? A lot of them. When I came here, it was about half and half blue collar and professional people, mm -hmm. white collar. And that was ideal as far as I was concerned. That's the kind of place I wanted to raise a family, and I intended to do that. But uh, the, 
emphasis has become more and more white collar. And uh, two things happen. One I very much disapprove of. A lot of the old blue collar people stayed around and laughed about, boy, those rich professional people going to Boston, I ripped them off. That's not good. And, and it's died out now mm -hmm. pretty much. There's only one or two I can think of that are still left that used to talk like that. But the laboring blue collar group is much diminished now. Mm -hmm. Essentially, it's the children of the people that were blue collar when I was here. Holliston is the world, and they enjoy it. It enjoys them, they've prospered. So the blue collar group is probably stable, but mm -hmm. it's shrinking. Yes. In proportion to the white collar. Was it, it was it was a very friendly town then. Did people uh, get together in at their homes? Did they get together in in uh, community groups? How, oh, what was yeah. the social did, life like? We did things that are grossly illegal today. <laughs> uh, man long gone, Frank Reese. For some reason, we met in his basement, the Zoning Bylaw Study Committee. Nobody was invited to our meetings. We met once a month uh, in Frank Reese's basement, and Freddie Cole was on the board, and he supplied the peanuts and the soda. So we sat there eating peanuts and drinking soda and plotting the future of the town. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were other meetings that took place in people's house. Uh, that's all against the law now, as you know. Uh, meetings have to be public and accessible. Sure. Uh, the law was there then, but it wasn't enforced. Mm -hmm. Correct, yeah. So um, you became a state rep in 1970. Yeah, what made I, you want to run for office? Well, I was a selectman before that. You were. Oh, okay. So, so let's start with that. When you were a selectman, what were the big issues back then? Mostly keeping things as they were. Uh, we were somewhat trying to resist turning the whole town into uh, uh, small Brentwoods. And of course it didn't work. We, mm -hmm. uh, they, they evolved to be that way. Uh, and that was where the explosion of the population occurred. So, so yeah, so you were trying to maintain the character of the town um, when, and by, you know, like now we don't have any big, any, uh, any uh, big box stores in our town or, or any chains to speak of. So you guys recognized that back then that you wanted to keep that, yeah, that had, feeling. We also had three rules, and the third one I never can remember until after I leave. Mm -hmm. but one of them was, if nobody bothers us, we must be doing things about right. Okay. And the other was, uh, where there is no violation, or where there is no complaint, there is no violation. Uh, guys had workshops in their homes, mm -hmm. and uh, they weren't doing that for charity. They'd take your money if you paid them to glue a chair together or something. But what was the need of a fight about that? We decided to leave those things alone mm -hmm. until somebody complained about trucks and things. If it got too big, we'd have to tell them, no, this is not zoned for that. Right. I could jump way ahead and tell you something that might be helpful, if, even if we say it now. Mm -hmm. When we talked about the Zoning Bylaw Study Committee, uh, industry was beginning to move into town. Uh, they were small shops. Uh, a shop that employed 20 people was a good-sized shop. And we thought of industry in that context. And we had that big chunk of land that Amazon is looking at now. Oh, sure. Hopping Brook. Hopping Brook. What do we do with that? It's mostly on the edge of a wet cranberry bog, but there are areas where you can install shops like the kind that we envisioned as industry. Mm -hmm. So we turned the whole thing into a big industrial park. Oops. One big guy comes in and he wants the whole thing. And you've heard all the arguments. We don't need to repeat them here, I don't think. But it was a terrible mistake. We thought everything between 
west of uh, Milford all the way to uh, the line in Wellesley mm -hmm. would be little small machine shops and stuff like that. Well, the future, you, you can't predict the future. So uh, we that was... probably could have done more homework. Mm. Uh, I, I'm as guilty as anybody. I voted for those things. Uh, but we were thinking in a context that wasn't up to date. And uh, I'm sure that six of us, I think it was, that sat at that table, every one of us saw another Charlie Shepard or something of that sort. Shepard had a little machine shop that mm -hmm. was just exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we were wrong. So when you, um, when you became uh, state rep, what made you want to run for that? The Republican Town Committee. <laughs> it was that simple. Yeah. Uh, they approached me. I was self-employed. And uh, they asked me if I'd consider it. I wasn't too long married by that time. I talked it over with my wife. And, we decided that we'd give it a shot. I don't think we really thought I was going to get appointed or <laughs> elected, but I did run. And the other part of my business does tie in with this. Um, I worked for 35 years, mostly at home, but mostly for Harvard University. I uh, was restoring their collection of clocks and scientific instruments by that time. Uh, Go back to why I did that. The old man that I was working for was terminally ill. He didn't tell me that. He had a son that had a problem. And he says, if you go out and buy a lathe, I'll see that you have enough work to get started. And so I started really going like gangbusters to build a shop, and then moved it out here and mm -hmm. then goes on. So I had more control of my time than a lot of people. Exactly. And that made me available. And it appealed to me. Uh, what were, the, what were the primary issues back then on the statewide level? It was another case of keeping things running smoothly. Mm -hmm. uh, the state had not too long changed over from Republican to Democrat. And they went full force. Uh, it's hard to find a Republican, still is. Uh, they used to say we could caucus in a phone booth. <laughs> and uh, when I went there, that was about true. And it never changed. This is, uh, the division is within the Democratic Party. There are more conservative people and there are more liberal people. Uh, but the exchanges are between those two groups. And the Republicans can go along or lump it. It doesn't matter. There aren't enough of them to make any difference. This might interest you as a side issue on that. First of all, we weren't like the example that you get in Congress now. We were friends. We'd fight and then go out to dinner together. Mm -hmm. Democrats and Republicans, and, and uh, probably more of my friends were liberal Democrats. But we would, uh, how did I want to explain that? Uh, I think you did just explain it quite well, actually. Uh, we, oh, there, there were a group of us. We counted ourselves up and we outnumbered the Republicans. Uh, some Republicans and more Democrats. And it's majority minority. We could have stepped up and said, we are the minority. We outnumber the Republicans. So you have to recognize us. We thought that was a great idea. Uh, we all thought about the same, and uh, where we didn't, we could make our changes reasonably. And then Bobby Creedon, who's still a friend of mine, he's almost as old as I am. I think he's still in the Senate. He said, this would be fine except for one thing. He said several things. I'm Irish. I'm Catholic. I live in a three-decker house in Brockton. And if I broke any of those rules, I would be out. Hmm. So it was a... You had to be a Democrat? Yes. Yeah. Catholic? Uh, yep. You, well, the, th the fourth one was I live in a th three-family house. Yep. And 
he was right. What kind of uh, legislation did you, uh, did you work on when you were there? Well, my first assignment was on the Public Safety Committee, assumably because uh, I would be familiar with that as my in my experience as a selectman. Uh, and that was, I worked with the police, of course, when all the selectmen do. Uh, the next year, I think it was, uh, I served two terms in there. Mm -hmm. uh, my second term, uh, they put me on the uh, uh, local affairs committee, I have trouble remembering the name of it. Uh, we dealt with stuff that had to be dealt with in the legislature, dealing with local bylaws. For example, okay. uh, if Hollison had a bylaw that you can't cross the street except at a grade crossing, uh, we'd have to have approval of the state legislature to do that. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a whole number of things that conflict with state law, and state law has precedent unless okay. Special Act permits a change. Uh, so there was plenty of that business. The other thing, <laughs> all these guys are gone now. I'm going to tell you a story. That they worked together in and out of the State House. There were little cliques in every town. There was a guy came in, he was trying to do a number on another guy that was in the house from the same town. And it was a terrible example of that. And I questioned him, really embarrassed him. And as soon as the hearing was ended, Joe DiCarlo, who later spent some time in the slammer for some of his shenanigans, uh, Joe DiCarlo walks up to me, and he grabbed the front of my shirt, and he says, I want you to understand something. He was the chairman. Mm -hmm. I want you to understand something, Rep. You never embarrass a member of this house in front of a committee. And I grabbed his shirt, and I said, I had constituents sitting there, and I'll be damned if I was going to allow you to embarrass me just because of your little shenanigans. Mm -hmm. and he backed off after that. I'm sure he did, yeah. So uh, uh, did, what are some of the other uh, challenges uh, of being in the legislature at that time? Well, one that bothered me considerably was if you can take an 18-year-old and hand him a rifle, he ought to be able to handle a bottle of beer. And a group of us, mostly Democrats in that particular gesture, uh, got a bill passed in the House that said if you were 18 years old, you could drink in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was literally months after that that the federal government jumped in and said you had to be 20 years old. So that took care of our yeah. little gesture. But uh, that one was somewhat important to me. I'm trying to remember some of the others. So many of them were little Mickey Mouse things, but they were important to a handful of people mm -hmm. in some local community. The public sa safety stuff was more general. Mm, yes. And I remember a guy from the legislature, they'd come in and ask for anything, see if you'd give it to them. They wanted permission to impose the punishment without you having to go to court if you got stopped for a traffic violation. And I remember asking the representative uh, what they had in mind, garroting at sunrise. <laughs> uh, they try. Yeah. You, you might let it slip by. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> at that time, there was a guy that was quite famous in Massachusetts, uh, McLaughlin, Richard E. McLaughlin. He was a general in the State National Guard as well. But he, uh, how, how did he put it? Oh, I have a summer place uh, down in Onset. He said, it's where all the wealthy Irish go. We don't have to bother with the rest of you. <laughs> <laughs> So now that you've been here for 60 years, you've seen some changes, the town's bigger now. Um, is there any, what would you tell uh, a citizen of Holliston today? You've, you've been a citizen all these years, you've served in many capacities, had your business here. What, what would you tell us today uh, as a citizen? What was the well, best? Well, on a practical basis, there are two things that I've been trying to suggest, and they aren't 
ready for him. It may never be. But not long ago, they talked about revising and improving the library. And on either side of the library was a building for sale and looking for an occupant. And I kept trying to tell them, take those two buildings by eminent domain. You've got a, almost a whole city block, parking space, room to build the library you want. Mm -hmm. Well, they didn't do it. They let them both get rented. True. And you could still do it, but it's a lot harder now. You've got two businesses that you encouraged to come in. So that one went down the drain. The other one, we do not need another high school, in my opinion, which is only my opinion. Uh, we have less kids now than we had, uh, but there's always that urge to have something new. Mm -hmm. All right, that usually means that we'll end up with the third high school in the time that I've been here. Uh, maybe not, maybe I'll go before I have to see it. But the thing is, right now, go in there and take that land that, what's his name, the, the Amazon wants. Oh, sure. The, the, for the high school. We can do it, it's eminent domain, we have the right to do it. We're either going to pay lawyers for years after years after years and end up collecting a few dollars of taxes from Amazon when they figure they've taken everything to court. Mm -hmm. Or we're going to pay what it is worth now to take that land and use it for a high school. There's more land than you'd need for a highway department, but they could consider that too. What would you, as a citizen, would, do you think, would you encourage people to get involved, to run for office, to, what, what's the most valuable thing someone could do in this town today to make it a better, to make it, to keep it going? Well, I love to see people run, but I also refer to what I call and was part of amateur government. Uh, most of us are not trained in that subject. I certainly wasn't. I brag claim that I was enough of a quick study that after I got in the legislature, I caught on. But when I ran, I sounded just like two guys that are running right now. Uh, they talk very idealistically. They got a lot to learn, just as I did. Mm -hmm. So it's not their fault. So you need professional people. And you need really professional people. Never mind having a friend of a friend form a committee and do a study for the town. Uh, we've had enough of that uh, over the years. But for example, the one that has always bothered me, the selectmen have a budget. They uh, control the police department, they control other the highway department. So they have just as much of a budget as the school committee has or uh, other activities in town and yet they appoint the town treasurer. No, that's wrong. It's always been wrong. We should elect a board to find a professional treasurer and appoint her or him. Okay. No contact otherwise. In other words, checks and balances. Yeah. On it. Yep. And it's seriously lacking between the selectmen and mm -hmm. that sort of thing. And. Uh, I don't think I want to comment on the current efforts to streamline the government. Uh, uh, some of them have been around since I was a selectman. And it just it looks like it may be a good time to try to pull some of them. But more than anything, it's reducing further the amount of um, elected people that are making decisions. Yeah. There's another problem. When you have a town I always want to call him the manager, and that's incorrect. It's, uh, uh, the it's it is Paul Lebeau's old job. Right. It is the town manager, I, I believe, yeah. The selectmen let him make all kinds of decisions. Now, he's going to appoint people. That's part of his decision making. Who is he going to appoint? Somebody that agrees with him. Well, may, yeah, maybe. If he knows everybody in town, but maybe not. I don't know. Well, I certainly don't want to have to spend my time fighting in the town hallway. Uh, 
So I'm going to appoint somebody to do what I think they should do. Mm -hmm. The reason I know what they should do is I probably talked to them before I appoint them. Um, so that's, it diminishes the amount of <coughs> control that the selectmen have that they probably should have hung on to. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't need to review every pothole in the roads. Uh, you've got a highway superintendent to do that. Right. The other thing that we used to do when I was a selectman, I'm not sure it's as necessary as it once was, but I would like to know that the highway superintendent, that the uh, town treasurer, uh, some of the other positions that I have trouble thinking of when I need them, uh, the finance committee even, they should come before the selectman. The finance committee does because they're fighting mm -hmm. right now. Yep. But they should come before the selectmen at least once a month and answer questions directly from the selectmen. Uh, the town administrator, that's the term I was looking for, talks to all those people. Mm -hmm. And the selectmen never see any of them. Well, it seems like you, uh, you're in favor of direct uh, contact with people and people getting involved in government, and that can make towns a better place to live in. I think um, it would be better if more people had their thumb in the pie, mm -hmm. even though they're going to have to rely on professional advice. Mm -hmm. Sure. And it's complicated now to run a town. It's a, it is. That's the big change, I think, too, from when you were here, is how much more complex it is to run a town like this. I made a comment to Mary not long ago, and she didn't have a quick answer, and I don't either. But I objected to some of what they wanted to do. And I said, every time I look up, there's another desk with feet under it. And I said, uh, uh, there are other towns around here that hire people whose lips move when they read, but they hand them a shovel and they get things done. Uh, Milford, for example, has never had an override. Hmm. Interesting. Since... You really follow politics. That's, that is your... Not, not like I used to, but yeah. I, I see these things and read them once yeah. in a while. Yeah. But if... Well, now I lost the... Oh. There are less kids now than there were going to go to this new high school if they decide to build it. How do you justify that? And a few other things where Mary says, well, it makes the town more efficient. I said, well, if it's more efficient, why do the taxes go up? We're trading one for another. Uh, I, don't, I don't see that as efficiency. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, maybe there are some things that we don't need to do. Well, that might be the future. I don't know. So, uh, John, is there anything in your life that you would uh, change looking back? Uh, no, most of my life I didn't plan in the first place. <laughs> There you go. I noticed that you came here today in a car that is certainly quite uh, quite exciting and unusual. What kind of a car is that? That's a around town that's called the Capone Mobile. It's a <laughs> 1930 Chrysler sedan. Uh, I saw it several years ago and had the money at the time and bought it. I had always wanted an early American car. And the reason I'm using it now is my regular car's in the garage, it has to be repaired. But uh, it's, it's, it's just fun. It's my hobby, I guess. That's great. So you still you drive it and you, and you work on it yourself a little bit? I can't do as much as I used to. Mm -hmm. I can't get down and get up again. But yep. I, do, I did not restore it. I bought it restored. Mm -hmm. yep. But I've had to maintain it. I've had sure. it five or six years now. Sure. And, uh, it's my main hobby. The other thing is, I saw on your list that you wanted to know what my hobbies were. I don't think I really had any. My work was my hobby. That that's, can be the case for so many people. Yeah. yeah. I fell into it, more or less, and I loved every minute of it. I still go out to my shop. I don't take work now because it doesn't get done. Yeah. But uh, I still go out there. And I still keep an office out there. And... Uh, so it's my playroom now. Well, John, you're a lucky man that your work was your hobby and you're still driving that great car. And I want to thank you so much for talking to us about your life in Holliston. Well, and you're certainly welcome. I hope it's helpful. We, and, we appreciate uh, it.
So, Thank you for and we'll, inviting me. Yeah. We'll be celebrating the 300th with you in two more years. So how's that? Oh, I'm going to hang on for it. Good, good. Thank you so much. Thank you. For Heartbeat of Holliston, this is Chris O'Lawless.